Shalom, Christopher Enoch here. We're going to read um, Matthew chapter 2 uh, in this uh, session. I'm going to get right into this. Now when Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, behold, wise men, it says here the word for wise men can also mean teachers, scientists, physicians, astrologers, seers, interpreters of dreams, or sorcerers from the east came to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. That's a a lot of people that were troubled, a lot of people just think about Herod himself being troubled, but it says all Jerusalem was, was troubled with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he asked them where the Christ or where Mashiach or where Messiah would be born. So they, you know, they, there, was the, there was this feeling in the air, more than just a feeling. There was this, there was this almost tangible um, atmosphere that Messiah is at our doorstep. They said to him, in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem, or Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written through the prophet, you Bethlehem, land of Judah, you are in no way least among the princes of Judah, for out of you shall come a governor who shall shepherd my people Israel. And this is Mika 5.2. So let's read this. Let's go over to Mika 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata. Let's look at the quote in Matthew again here. But you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, Hmm. are in no way least among the princes of Judah. So the actual scripture that Matthew is quoting here, uh, quoting here says, being small among the clans of Judah. Out of you will come out to me, that is, oh, excuse me, out of you one will come out to me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Let's see what, how Matthew quoted this. For out of you shall come a governor who shall prosper, or excuse me, who shall shepherd my people Israel. Hmm. So out of you, uh, out of you, one will come to, out to me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings out are from of old, from ancient times. I find it interesting here right away that you notice that quotes like this, quotes where we're looking at one author of Scripture is quoting another author of Scripture. And we find this often where the quotes are either partial quotes or either, or and many times like summarized quotes. They're not verbatim. You can hardly ever find verbatim quotes. Like, you know, uh, today in this age, we're living in too much of a digital age where everything is just perfect, or at least, you know, um, not perfect, but it's like, if you don't quote things verbatim, if you don't quote things word for word, um, you're considered to be misquoting or, you know, or whatever. But back in those days, you know, it was never quoted word for word. Um, and you may see it here. Um, but I know that, you know, some of you would be thinking, hey, this is a Jewish author, Matthew, writing in Greek, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew. And, and we are reading an English translation of the Greek of the translation of the Hebrew. <laughs> so there, there would naturally be loss. Even if he did quote it word for word, we would have a lot, we would have different renderings 
because of the whole structure here, going from Hebrew to Greek, you lose some there. And then from Greek to English, you lose some there too. You lose some accuracy. Uh, and, and so also when it comes to just, you know, the, um, uh, say, for, the, for example, the book of Micah, Mika, uh, Hebrew into English. So, yeah, there's lots of factors coming into place here. But it's very important to understand that, you know, some people say that, for example, when Jude quotes Enoch, that he didn't quote him, quote Enoch verbatim, therefore it's not, you know, it's not accurate or it's, you can't trust it or whatever. I mean, but if they use that same judgment, if they use that same measure uh, with other books of the Bible, um, you know, they would find the same thing with all, all or, you know, many of the other quotes. Let's get on here. Then Herod secretly called the wise men. Very interesting. And learned from them exactly what time the star appeared. He sent them to Beit Lechem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. When you have found him, bring me word so that I also may come and worship him. They, having heard the king, went their way, and behold, the star which they saw in the east went before them until, they, until it came and stood over where the young child was. So this just wasn't a star in the sky, although it could have been. It sounds more like a, for lack of a better word, like an orb, you know. Um... I mean, it could have been a star in the sky, but uh, just, you know, just my thoughts. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. They came into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Opening their treasures, they offered to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, let's stop here for a minute. I think it's very important for you to understand the significance and the symbolism here. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let's start with myrrh. Myrrh is a bitter, um, not a spice, but myrrh is bitter. Myrrh is very bitter. And frankincense, we know, is very fragrant. And gold is, well, we all know what gold is, okay? But gold is representation of the kingly, the royal aspect of the Messiah, of Yeshua. Gold is the regal Messiah, the king, the king here. So gold stands for king, Frankincense, now that is a symbol of a priest because the priest would use frankincense many, I mean, in a lot of his rituals would be um, including frankincense, which is, uh, you know, like an incense that is actually burned uh, and uh, it's actually symbolic um, representation of prayers. So we got king, we got priest, and myrrh, is bitter. It's also a sign of death because they used myrrh to preserve dead bodies. Uh, when people died, they used myrrh as um, um, what do you call that? The preservative in the in, in, when you uh, embalm people. Okay, so myrrh being a there's that um, notation of death. And bitterness. Now, myrrh is the sign of the prophet, because the prophet's uh, a prophet's uh, purpose is to call people to die to self, to call people to repentance, and their message. A true prophet, their message is not sweet. The message is usually bitter. You have sinned. The nation has sinned. We need to repent. 
God calls us to repentance. And if you do not repent, the judgment of God will come. If you do repent, you know, God will relent from his judgment. So this is speaking of death. Repentance is not so much a work as it is a death. As I say, as I've said before, repentance is not doing. Repentance is dying. So myrrh is the sign of the prophet. So we got gold, frankincense, and myrrh. King, priest, and prophet. Verse 12, being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and stay there until I tell you, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Wow, once again, this is amazing here. A lot of people, I've never heard this preached before or taught before, but this, this is the truth. This is what I've seen here. Egypt was used, okay, of God to hide, preserve the Messiah, Yeshua. Egypt was used of God to hide, to preserve the people of Israel back in the days of Moshe, the days of Moses. The people of Israel went from Canaan to Egypt to basically as almost like a, as refugees, almost like, you know, uh, um, to take shelter in Egypt, to be preserved, almost like a time capsule. And uh, Abraham knew that, like, you know, that his seed will be in Egypt for 400 years and then uh, finally delivered out of the bondage of Egypt. But we got more than this, okay? Egypt is also the, uh, the origin or the home of the Coptic Orthodox Church, which is the mother church, so to speak, of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which was used of God, okay? So the Ethiopian, let me just back up here for a second so you, so you understand, so you follow me here. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church is directly descended or connected to the Egyptian Orthodox Church, okay? Ethiopian, Egyptian. Ethiopian is like an offshoot of the Egyptian church, more or less. It was the Ethiopian church that was used to hide, preserve many of the ancient texts that did not reach to, that did not make it to Rome, that didn't, that, that was lost in other parts of the world, such as the book of Jubilees, the book of Enoch, and many other texts and practices. So yes, Egypt here is a very interesting, this is a very, very powerful thing you need to understand. God uses Egypt and the offsprings of the Egypt, if you will, like, like, for example, the Ethiopian Orthodox. God uses Egypt as like a time capsule, as like a place of hiding, as a place of refuge, okay, a place of preserving not only um, the ancient scriptures, the book of Enoch, the book of Jubilees, like I know you say it wasn't really directly, you know, right in Egypt per se. It was in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but the Ethiop Ethiopian Orthodox Church considers Egypt to be their, their origins, okay? So, yeah, uh, it was through Egypt, at the book of Enoch, the book of Jubilees, um, you know, the Revelations... Uh, or the Kalamentos um, scriptures and many other scriptures from the Ethiopian Orthodox tradition has been preserved. Ancient, true Christianity. Now, I'm not saying that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is absolutely perfect. No, but they were used to preserve a lot of these things. Actually, in Ethiopia, there is actual video footage of uh, of um, uh, of artifacts 
that is claimed to be from the Temple of Solomon, including the the silver trumpets, the gomer, um, the breastplate, the forks that was used for the sacrifices and such. You can find this all in um, actually uh, Digging for the Truth series and the Ark of the Covenant actually uh, uh, documented all this on video. And also, speak of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is there, preserved in Ethiopia, as well as the rest of the, you know, as, as well as many of the artifacts of the Temple of Solomon. Very awesome. I mean, that's a totally, totally different subject. But that all comes back to this whole thing. Flee into Egypt, okay? Flee into Egypt, a place where God tucks away the... Um, the artifacts, the relic, the relics, the relics of the ancient, of uh, the ancient uh, Jewish people, of the ancient uh, um, uh, patriarchs of the faith. He tucks, he tucks these artifacts away in uh, the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox, which came through Egypt, um, or at least is finds its origins in Egypt, tucks away the children of Israel in Egypt in the days of Moses, tucked away here, um, the young child, uh, speaking of Yeshua, Jesus, and his mother, Mary, um, and it says here, stay there until I tell you, uh, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So yeah, the Ark of the Covenant was sought but preserved in Ethiopia. The Book of Enoch was sought, but preserved in, in Ethiopia. The Book of Jubilees was sought, but preserved in Ethiopia. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, yeah. Verse 14. He arose and took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and, and, uh, and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. And that is in Hosea 11.1. 1. So let's go there. Okay. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Okay. Once again, not a direct quote, not a full quote of the full verse. However, you know, you get my point. Verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and sent out and killed all the male children who were in Bethlehem, Bethlehem and in all the surrounding countryside. From two years old and under, according to the exact time which he had learned from the wise men. Then that which was spoken by the by Jeremiah, who Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Okay, well, just a second here. Here again, here again. Um, wow, here we got the killing of male children, the killing of the youngest children. Okay. Every time you see that there is a major change in the world, a major change, spiritually speaking, okay, we have someone slaughtering children. In the days of Moses, when Moses was born, Pharaoh slaughtered all the youngest children, the, the firstborn or the male children. Here with, in the time of Jesus, we have the children, the youngest, the most vulnerable children being innocent, innocent, innocent children slaughtered. Can you imagine going to heaven and seeing all these innocent children slaughtered? Say, I was the ones that were, that were slaughtered. I was slaughtered at the time when Jesus was just a little baby. <sighs> hmm. Now, today, we have the slaughtering of children as well in abortion. 
You know, the mothers say, this is my body, but it's not real. It's not your, I'm, I'm sorry, but there's another body inside of you with a totally different DNA, a totally different human being inside of your body. So no, it's not your body. Um, your body is your body. Yeah, do whatever you want with it. But when you have a baby inside of your body, that baby is not your body. That baby, although is part of not part of your body per se, but is in your body, is not your body. It's not your DNA. It's not your blood going through the veins. Uh, it's the baby has its own the baby has its own bloodstream. Um, yeah. Um, major spiritual change. We're on the brink of a major, major, major age uh, today. Uh, and this is a prophetic sign, the, the abortion holocaust, which is so much more horrific than any other holocaust we've ever seen. Um, I mean, we look back to the holocaust of the six million Jews that were slaughtered innocently by the hands of Hitler. And we say, how can we have let this happen? I guarantee you the day is coming when people look back and say, how can we have let this happen without, let, without doing anything about it? Yeah, uh, many innocent children slaughtered today, just as they were when Moses came in that age, major change in, in ages, as well as when Jesus came. Now we're looking at another major prophetic age. We're on the, we're on the threshold of it. And again, the slaughter of children. Very, very important to understand that here we've got the males targeted. In this day and age, also, we have masculinity targeted, killed, okay? We've got, <laughs> I mean, they say that testosterone, every generation in the past 100, 150 years, has, testosterone has decreased, in, you know, exponentially, there's many reasons for it. You mean you mean lack of real hard work, you know, diet, all these chemicals in our, you know, water and in our food today, um, being bombarded through the media with all of these anti-masculine, anti-male thing, so misandrist, so much misandry going on today. It's incredible. Hey, back then, they killed the males. Okay, so yeah, it's a sign of the time. Now, here we go again. Another uh, quote from another prophet, Jeremiah, who was quoted here saying, A voice was heard in Rama, lamentation, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. She wouldn't be comforted because they are no more. That is in Jeremiah, who? Jeremiah 31 15. Okay. Let's look at this. Here we go. Yahuwah, or some people pronounce it Yahweh, or the Lord, says, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. I didn't remember seeing that word bitter back here. Uh, weeping in great mourning. Okay. Rachel weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Let me just read on here. Yahuwah says, refrain, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, says Yahuwah. They will come again from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your latter end. Your children will come again to their own territory. That almost sounds like two totally different ages, so to speak, here. Like, it sounds like more like this here is like the rebuilding the coming again of the Jews into the into the land of Israel as what what we've seen here just in the past generation um yeah we're living <laughs> bible prophecy okay very very interesting here you need to check this out okay and this is something you never hear preached in church Rachel weeping for her children What's this talking about? 
see the people who have gone on, especially the people who are alive. Okay. You know, Jesus said, God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not the God of the dead, but of the living. Okay. So there are a lot of people who died who are dead. They're dead. But there are a lot of people who have passed on who are alive. <laughs> They're alive. Okay. Because they are righteous, they are righteous, and um, you know they have it. They have attained to eternal life. Rachel is one of them. Rachel was alive when all this was going on, and it's like she was weeping for her children. Now you say, why would you say weeping? Why would you say? It's Rachel's children. Like these, this is like you know, thousands of years after Rachel was even born. But yet, her biological descendants, she counted as still her children. Uh, very important. You know, it's very important to have a family and to uh, to invest in your family with all your heart, because it can go for thousands of years, and they're all your children okay so yeah um we see it in the book of luke verse uh chapter chapter 16 when the rich man died and in, in, in uh, lazarus died lazarus was passed away and he was alive per se and the rich man was dead per se in hell lazarus and lazarus could see the rich man heaven can see hell, and how can see heaven and it seemed like they also knew what was going on on, on earth as well um, by the way they spoke to each other. You know, go and tell my brothers, you know, don't go and tell my family not to come to this place of torment, you know, and um, begging and, and such. So, yeah, um, Rachel weeping for her children. I don't think that they are completely ignorant in heaven of what's going on here on earth. I don't think so. And so, yeah, let's, let's get on here with the reading. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. Very interesting. They call it the land of Israel, not the land of any other nation or people. Mm-hmm. For th- for those who sought the young child's life are dead. So he arose and he took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Being warned in a dream, he withdrew into the region of Galilee, and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. Uh, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prophets, that he will be called a Nazarene. <sighs> yeah, that reminds me. Um, Nazarene, Nazareth, Nazarite. It all comes from the same root word, meaning set apart, separate, holy, very holy. I believe that, na- that Jesus was a, uh, he took the Nazarite vow. Uh, as per uh, in the book of Numbers, uh, the Numbers number speaks about the Nazarite vow. Um, I believe that Jesus took the Nazarite vow. I believe that's why he did not drink of the fruit of the vine uh, at the Last Supper, um, because he was um, he took the fruit. I mean, he took he was under the Nazarite vow. Uh, why wouldn't he be? I mean, the Nazarite vow was a vow for the whole, it was like the holiest, most strict vow you could take to enter into the most holy um, way of living. Why wouldn't Jesus take that? Now, I'm just saying this because you know, I've, I've, I've had someone say, well, he was a Nazarene. That doesn't mean he was a Nazarite. It's two totally different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what? I'm not saying... I'm just I'm just saying the word Nazarene here rem- reminded me of the word Nazarite. And I believe that Jesus was both a Nazarene and a Nazarite. I believe that he took the Nazarite vow as well as he was a Nazarene as well. Um, but yeah, 
So that's it. So in uh, next video, we're going to be uh, talking about, uh, we're going to be reading and reviewing and studying Matthew chapter 3. So don't, uh, don't miss it. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to check me out on social media and also my blog at ChristopherEnoch.org. And um, I pray that this video was a blessing to you and uh, pray that you'd be able to retain. Think about the stuff that was just read and think about the stuff that I said. And uh, may God give you insight, knowledge, and memory to retain all that, uh, that he has to say here. Thanks for watching. God bless you.